Well, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many of you guys here, and what an honor it is to be a part of 92Y Talks, to say nothing of being a part of 92Y Talks with one of the finest songwriters of our time, Lucinda Williams. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at the woman who wrote Joy, Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, Get Right with God, Change the Locks, Passionate Kisses, Something About What Happens When We Talk, Buttercup, Drunken Angel, Pineola, Essence, Righteously, I Envy the Wind, Compassion, and so many more tunes that have become a huge part of our lives since the 80s. We can all agree on that, right? <clears throat> a wonderful songwriter. Hello, Lucinda. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank Good you. Uh, too. Uh, thank you for all the songs. Down Where the Spirit Meets the Bone. Oh, so just to give an overview, uh, we're going to chat. Lucinda's going to play a song or two, and then we'll do some questions uh, from you guys. So I hope you came up with some good ones. So that's how our, our uh, evening here uh, will unfold. Uh, Lucinda, your latest is your 11th album, Down Where the Spirit Meets the Bone, yeah. and it's a double album. Much has been written about the power of the double album and what a um, renegade move that was for you to do your, your not your first double album, but yeah. a, your first studio um, double album. That was so important to you as an artist to take charge and to um, do it, uh, if you will, your way this time around. Yeah. Well, I had wanted to do a double album before, um, but well, I was on Lost Highway, you know, for uh, several years, you know, a great relationship with them. And then my last um, album with them was Blessed, and then they're not they went away and you know they're gone so i ended up um signing with 30 tigers and at the same time um my husband tom and i one of the things that we wanted to do was to have our own label under the umbrella of 30 tigers mm -hmm. so the whole situation is really a win-win mm -hmm. thing you know, and, a, and a vote uh, for independence too, right? Yeah, and what I was going to say was I, when the West album came out, I actually wanted that to be a double album at the time, but the label, you know, didn't want to do that for business reasons, whatever, you know, they'd have to charge more for it, and then people might not want to pay the extra money for a double album, I don't know, whatever, so. <laughs> You know, which is really disappointing to me because I had all these songs I wanted them to, you know, come out at the same time, you know. Right. So this time I ended up, we actually had about 30 something tracks. So, and there were a lot of really good ones that we just knew there was no way we we're gonna be able to, you know, narrow this down to one album. It's just not gonna happen. So, you know. We, so we broke, we were able to break some rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that renegade spirit. And you notoriously have not been the kind of songwriter who would find yourself at album time with more songs than you needed. Yeah. So this is a, uh, this is, kind of a, this was kind of new terrain for sort you. Sort of, but you know, it actually started happening around the West album. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I've been sort of in a steady flow since then. But, What's your, uh, what's your take on that? What's the explanation? Everybody asks me, I don't know. I guess if um, you knew, right, you'd know the secret to life, but. I mean, you know, I'm kind of an anomaly, I guess. Um, I just, maybe because I didn't get discovered till later, or, you know, I'm not sure what to attribute it to. Mm -hmm. um, maybe because I grew up around poets and novelists, and, age isn't an issue or a factor it's just a whole separate thing you know than the rock pop world whatever you know so you know you don't just quit writing just because you get to a certain age or whatever and i had to go through this whole period of you know when i met my husband tom and we got engaged and then there was this whole every time i did an interview this was right, right around the time in between West and Little Honey. And almost every time I did an interview, they would ask, I would be asked, well, your fans are wondering or, or concerned, you know, are you still going to be able to write songs? And, 
what are you going to write about? And will you still be able to write? And I'm serious. They were serious. And, uh, you you know, mean they were suggesting because you were now happy and in love and had a yes. decent man in your life? I was and that now, was like, you know, comfortable right. and everything. You know, so a good man's going to ruin that songwriting. <laughs> yeah, or just the whole comfort right. zone thing. And I think part of that comes from you know because they do probably see other artists who, as they get older and more comfortable. Um, kind of fizzle out, you know, some of them do, a lot of them do, right. you know, so they're just not used to, you know, seeing an, an older artist like myself, you know, still continuing to go and write and do the whole thing, you know, it's like right. I'm supposed to be kind of, you know, fizzling out, I guess, or something. I don't know. Playing shows in Branson, maybe? <laughs> yeah, or something like that, you know. Um, but the thing is, what I found it really somewhat liberating as a writer because it really forced me to look at other subjects to write about huh. and really opened up a whole, you know, window, really, of possibilities. Because I've always wanted to write about you know, write more topical songs, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, the way that Bob Dylan did, like Masters of War and With God on Our Side, and, right. you know, and the way Steve Earle does so well, and, you know, but those were always more challenging right. Right. for me to do, and um, so, you know, and Bob Dylan could read a story in the newspaper and write a song about it, like Hurricane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. So that's what I wanted to be able to do more. So that's what I've been, you know, kind of tr working on, trying to do more of that kind of thing. Because you really have changed your, the output of your creativity um, drastically from the beginning of your career. Like I did the math, it was um, first 20 years, five albums, last seven years, four albums. And that's a yeah. huge shift. Well, in the see, that's because I, once I got signed to Rough Trade, I mean, it's not Rough Trade, Lost Highway, then there was consistency, mm -hmm. you know, because I was with them long enough. Right. What happened, see, this is what people don't understand in the beginning. When I first got signed, it was with Rough Trade Records. And this was the late 70s or late 80s. And you know, that album came out, the self-titled one, and then, because before a trade saw me, nobody would sign, I couldn't get signed. No, none of the big labels, small labels, you know, they didn't know what to do with me, because, you know, what I was doing was really kind of Americana. Right. I guess, you know, now they have a name for it, but at the time, there was no market for that, so it was all about the marketing. So, Along comes Row Trade, this punk label out of London, England. They had the Smiths and the Pixies, and they were looking to kind of broaden their horizons, and so they heard this demo tape I'd done, and they, they said, we like your voice and we like your songs. Do you want to make a record? And, of course, I said yes. I didn't have any other options and <laughs> you know then as soon as that album came out of course here come the other labels here they come. now they're you know sniffing around and all of a sudden so anyway so then I went I met, I met Bob Buziak who was this really cool guy he was the head of A&R for RCA Records and he was signing really cool artists like Treater Wright, who later became Morphine. And anyway, so there I was torn, you know, they wanted to sign me. So I went with them only because of Bob Buzia. So now I'm on RCA. So then Bob Buzia decides to leave. He has a falling out. He takes all the cool people with him. <laughs> now I'm on RCA with the new guy who's a numbers man who doesn't understand me. My A&R guy has been appointed to me this is, you're gonna laugh when you hear this story. We were doing, this is right before the Sweeter World album. So the band and I are in, you know, rehearsing, whatever, the A&R guy's in there. 
and we're talking about producers, and I mentioned Bob Johnson. He said, who's Bob Johnson? I said, well, you know, he produced Blonde on Blonde. <laughs> he says, oh, is that a band? <laughs> I was serious, y'all. <laughs> His credibility <laughs> went out the window, <laughs> you know. So now here I am, I'm stuck. I'm going, oh God, why did I do this? Why did I leave her afraid, you know? And in the meantime, you know, we started recording and then he started taking certain tracks and sending them to New York to this guy, Dave Thorner, to remix for the radio. Now this is in the 80s. So the vocal gets pushed back, the drums and bass get pushed up front one of the songs he remixed was, uh, I think, Six Blocks Away or something. I don't know. So this guy, Bennett Kaufman, that was his. That's how, and I never remember people's <laughs> names. <laughs> and he was, you know, he called me up, for instance, one day. He goes, so I got the remix back. I got the mix. You got to come down in here. So I go to his office, you know, and I'm sitting there. He's jumping up and down in his Gucci shoes going, it sounds like a record now. Isn't it great? <laughs> and I go, I hate it. It sucks. And you know, so this goes on and I'm going to my, I'm thinking, I gotta get off this label. I can't take it. Wow. You know. But it was totally the wrong so, place in the wrong time. Yeah. So, um, so then, you know, the phone calls with the, attorneys and the blah blah none of that works <laughs> so until it's south by southwest and i'm on a panel called how does commercialism affect creativity <laughs> <laughs> so i started telling the story and one of the artists who was at the, on the panel was also friends with the head of rca and apparently he called him the next day and said, I don't think Lucinda Williams is really happy. <laughs> so then my manager at the time called me and said, you got dropped from the label. And I said, yes. <laughs> so then we start looking for, oh yeah. So then I followed Bob Buziak to Chameleon, mm -hmm. which is part of Electra. And I'm back with Bob, yay. <laughs> So then one day, my manager calls me and says, well, Chameleon's folded. They're gone. So this was now the early 90s. This is happening all the time. You remember. Yes. Like, it's just like the rug got pulled out from under, right. you know, all these labels. People were just getting fired and laid off and whatever, and labels were folding. And So now I'm looking for another label again. So Rick Rubin, American. So he signs me the Car Wills album. We get that done. So now everybody thinks that it's gotten all held up because of my perfectionism in the studio. But as you can see, a lot of all the, that's right. why there were so many gaps. Right, right. You know, because of all these labels up and down all over the place, you know. So, so there's Rick with Americans, we got the, the master for car wheels. Now it gets held in, it's, it's in the can for an entire year because now Rick is trying to switch distribution between Warner Brothers and Sony. And you know, he can't decide which one he wants to go with or something. So the album is in the can, you know, everybody's from, you know, everybody's freaking out. We gotta get this album out. He won't let it go, you know, and finally, my manager at the time, because he knew Rick from New York um, DJ days, because my manager then was Frank Kalari, and he used to DJ at some of the clubs in the 70s. And the, right. You know, so he knew Rick from the old days. So he finally, again, none of the lawyers called back and forth. None of that's working. So my manager calls up Rick and goes, Rick, dude, you know, I look into your third eye, brother. <laughs> you know, you've got to do the right thing. 
And Rick was kind of like, yeah, okay, I get it. You know. So then, in the meantime, Danny Goldberg was running Mercury in New York, and he wanted to buy the album, the, the Masters, from Rick. You know. And finally, after that call from Frank Calori, who kind of just went, this isn't about business, man. You know. This is your karma, dude. Come on. You know. <laughs> and that's what got Rick to move. So then, um, so then Danny Goldberg bought the, out the Masters from Rick, and then Carvels came out. That would have been 98, I guess, right? 1998? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And then, um, at this point, I'm living in Nashville, and Luke Lewis was running Mercury Records in Nashville. And at some point after Carvels came out, he decided to form... Uh, Lost Highway record, that label, under Mercury. Right. So that's... And then you went into Lost Highway. And that whole story really does just that's support... That's story. No, it's just, quite a story. Just keep it and, and tape it and write it down so I don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? We could do that. But I enjoy telling this story because there's so, it answers so many questions. Right. That I have to answer all the time, all the time, all the time, you know? But it also really so. supports the, the, the power of the independence that you're currently hanging mm -hmm. on to right now. And with Down Where the Spirit Meets the Bone, it being a double album, and then you telling me the story last time we spoke, how you already have a whole other album worth of material right. ready to go. And sometimes that major label system just doesn't understand that yeah. sort of timing of when an artist creates, that's when it yeah. should come out. It doesn't Well, there are a lot it. of things like, you know, like if I wanted to make a blues album, when I was on Lost Highway, it wouldn't. I could do that, but it wouldn't count in my contract. Mm. You know, as a real album. Yeah, it's you great know, that you tell so these stories because I think as music fans, as most of us don't know this stuff. See, like we that's don't. That's a thing. Yeah, we don't have any concept of this. You yeah. Know? So, very interesting. Indie's the way to go. Yes, uh, we're so glad about that. The, uh, the track on the album, Down Where the Spirit Meets the Bone, it's not the first time you've tapped into that particular lyric, which is the title of the album. You've referenced that line before, but it is a line from your dad's poem called mm -hmm. Compassion, which for the first time you put into song. Now, I don't know if you guys saw, I put it up on Facebook today, and Lucinda put it up on Facebook on Father's Day. Your dad just passed at the beginning of this year, um, mm -hmm. but you posted a video of your dad reading the poem to compassion, and then you performing the tune. At his house, yeah, their house in Arkansas. At his house, and it's yeah. just a beautiful um, video. If you guys haven't seen it yet, um, definitely dial it up. But it also was interesting because at the beginning you talk about how hard it is to turn a poem, to say nothing of it being your dad's yeah. poem, <laughs> but to turn a poem into a song. Right, yeah, it's a whole nother animal. You know, poor, and my dad was always really adamant about this because I can remember the 60s, he was teaching creative writing at, at Loyola at one point. We were living in New Orleans. And so, you know, we had the house was always full of his creative writing students and, you know, hanging out, spending the night. And, you know, it's many hours I've, you know, heard them talking and drinking and debating and, you know, and one of the things was whether Bob Dylan was a poet or not, <laughs> you know. But the, the younger poets would say, oh, yeah, he's a poet, he's a poet. My dad would, no, he's not a poet. He's a songwriter, you know. Ah. And I never really, you know, understood that until I tried to take one of his poems and turn it into a song. Had you no. tried before with other poems of his? Mm -hmm. And it just didn't? I tried with this much longer, more involved poem mm -hmm. called Why, Why Does God Permit Evil? Um, and, but this one, Tom encouraged me to, to take a stab at it because we were going to call the album Down Where the Spirit Meets the Bone. So obviously, you know, he said, well, if you could try to, you know, maybe. And so... I worked on it for two or three days, I guess. I think part of what encouraged me also was right before I'd done that, um, I kind of had a, some practice with, uh, I was asked to take one of this artist, Karen Dalton, 
you know, this album's just come out of her kind of found lyrics. Um, and so um, different female artists were asked to, you know, take a look at the lyrics and make a song out of, you know, a set of lyrics. And so I'd just been, you know, deal, doing that, which was very challenging, you know, and finally, and came up with a song for that. So I think that kind of started the mm -hmm. process and, you know. They're beautiful okay. words and it's a beautiful song. Do you, do you want to play that for us? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not this quite this uh, brazen and talkative but <laughs> I don't know what's got into me I think Rita makes you feel comfortable that's what it is she has it you have a talent for that you know you don't think you're it doesn't seem like you know you're doing anything out of the ordinary but there's something some vibe or something going on there That happened when I was, uh, Mark, am I saying it right? Mark Moran, Mark. Oh yeah, Mark Maron, the Mark podcast, Maron, guy, sorry. podcast guy. Yeah, I did a interview <laughs> thing at his house. Uh -huh. um, and the same thing happened. It seemed like he was hardly asking me anything and I was just sitting there blah, 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 and talking <laughs> about, you know, and my mother's and mental illness and the family and uh, you know. Um, so this is compassion. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. Since conceit is always a sign, always a sign, always a sign. For those you encounter, have compassion, even if they don't want it. What seems bad matters is always a sign, always a sign. Always a sign Always a sign Of things no ears have heard Always a sign Of things no eyes have seen You do not know What wars are going on Down there Where the spirit meets the bone Down there where the spirit meets the bone Down where the spirit meets the bone For everyone you listen to Have compassion Even if they don't want it what seems cynicism is always a sign, always a sign, always a sign, always a sign of things no ears have heard, always a sign of things no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on.
<laughs> Such a great line, down where the spirit meets yeah. the bone. And that is, wow. So you must have soaked up a lot as a kid in yeah, the house there, I mean, just not just from your dad, but just from the company he kept, yeah, right? Yeah. Probably set a pretty high bar, too. Yeah, like you couldn't yeah. be like, la, la, la. You couldn't no. have grown up and be a la, 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 ooh, baby, baby no, no. songwriter. No. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean. I set pretty high standards for myself, yeah. yeah. My dad had high standards, you know. Um, and I really looked up to him, so I really wanted to mm -hmm. please him and, you know, do just be outstanding you know, and all of that, and. Take us back to when you were a kid. What did, was there a moment when you knew, I want to be a writer, I want to be a songwriter? Well, I was really drawn. I mean, my mother studied music and played piano, and although she didn't pursue it as a career, but, um, you know, there was always a piano around the house and music books and everything, and you know, and. Um, I started taking guitar lessons in 1965, and you know, I was just really thrown into the whole, you know, the, that whole folk movement, music thing, you know, back then, it was so powerful, you know. So it was folk music that first pulled you in? Well, as a singer, a songwriter, mm -hmm. you know, but before that, you know, my dad listened to, you know, everyone from John Coltrane and Chet Baker to Hank Williams and, you know, Loretta Lynn and all that. So it was just whatever was on the radio and coming at me. So, you know, it just was all kind of coming in. Um, but then when I was sitting down, you know, kind of learning songs and all that, you know, those were, and plus the whole folk movement thing and the whole image and, you know, I love Joan Baez and, you know, her thin frame, her long hair, and her bare feet, and you know, <laughs> and, and I loved Peter Paul and Mary, you know. You have to remember, this was, I was like, you know, 12, so, right. you right. know. Um, so my dad got me guitar lessons. There was this guy who was in a rock band, and he would come over to the house once a week, and rather than you know, burdening me with music theory and all of that, we would just, I would pick a song I wanted to learn, and he would show me the chords and how to pick that song, you know, how to play that song, and then I would practice that song for that week, and then he, the next week we'd do another song, so, you know. Were you good at it? Did it come naturally to you at the time, do you recall? Uh, what do you I remember don't know. that? Yeah, but you My loved first, it. The first thing, instrument I ever played, yes, I loved it. The, my mother had a had a zither, and they kind of look like it. Kind of looks like a harpsichord chord, except you play it on your lap. And it had I think she would had it from when she was a girl, and it had this sheet music in the same shape, and you put it under the strings. Wow! You know, so you could go like this, so you could, you know, that was when I guess, guess I was about nine or ten. And then I had a Magnus chord organ. There are these little about this big. And it had, it was a similar kind of idea. You could put this sh music up above the keys so it would show you where, you know, which ones to play and everything. You know. Didn't Joni play a zither on All I Want? Or is, isn't that what Joni played on Blue? Wasn't huh? that a zither? Joni Mitchell, wasn't that a zither? No, that was a dulcimer. A dulcimer. Yeah. Right, right. right. But they're kind of connected, mm -hmm. probably, to, back to the to Appalachian, all of that. And at what point and did you cross the bridge into writing, like, or thinking, like, well, maybe I'll write well, my own stuff? Well, one of my dad's close friends, the writer Bill Harrison, uh, left it, it this beat-up guitar over at the house, and I kind of started messing around with it a little bit. So my dad got me a silver tone guitar from Sears, Roebuck and Company. <laughs> well, that's what they call it. it was <laughs> Roebuck and Company. And um, so that was my first guitar that I had and started, you know, doing, taking the guitar lessons and all that, you know, but 
I mean, the world of music was just so amazing right. back then, you know. It and settled in on TV. Like I had, yeah, and, you know, and just, I had the, the, the Bible of folk song, song books, which was Folk Song USA, the John, John and Ellen Lomax book, you know. And, but even before that, when I was a, probably around the age of eight or nine or something, these, my dad actually, we were gonna move to New York, to New York at one point. He, he got offered a job at a publishing company and piled us all into the station wagon, you know, with the luggage and everything. It came up here and the, the owner of the company, I guess, ended up giving the job to his son or something. And so my dad didn't get, it wasn't cool to be a Southern writer back then. Mm. So, you know, that wasn't in like it became later, you know. Right. So he was a struggling poet and, you know, and an academic, was he a, he was a professor? Yeah, he taught, yeah. and um, his, his uh, degree was actually in biochemistry initially, wow. because his advisor, you know how you have, deep, before you go to college, you know, well, this is what you should study or whatever, and, and he was told, you know, I don't think, you don't have the mind of a poet, or you're, I don't think that's a good, you know, you should go into the sciences. So he was studied, he, uh, his degree was in biochemistry. So that's what he taught at first, oh. before he taught creative writing. Hmm. Yeah. But anyway, what was I gonna say? Wait, I got off You were gonna study. say when, uh, when you crossed when the bridge I started from, to, get, to start writing, writing your own songs. Yeah, but why did, I was talking about coming up to New York and that didn't work out. So then we went back. I, now I've got off track, wait. Oh yeah, I had my guitar stolen out of the car. When you came to New York? In New York. Oh, yeah. New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we were such kicks, of course. You know, we parked the car, you know, with everything in it. <laughs> and then my dad and I, you know, walked around. I think we were in, it was in the village, you know, near Washington Square or something, and, you know, trying to see if we could find it or whatever. But, Anyway, was gone. So I think I've missed a link somewhere in <laughs> what I was trying to talk about. Are you going to edit this? Or <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's going to need any I editing. Need. <laughs> I don't think it's going to need any editing. Okay. So when did you cross the bridge from, you know, doing other people's songs and learning the, oh, folk, the, the Lomax thing? Yeah. You know, when did you, like, for example, do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Not that I'm, I'm not going to ask yes. you to play it, but like, do you remember? So what was, when was that and what okay. was it? Okay, I guess I was about 13 or something, and it was called The Wind Blows. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. And it was kind of like, the wind blows and it blows through the town, and the people in the town hear it blow. <laughs> The wind blows and it blows through the town and the people in the town hear it blow. And then it Great. <laughs> Great, thank you. You know. <laughs> I understood melody. Yes, yes you did. You know. <laughs> For songwriting, um, Lucinda, how much of it would you say is art and how much is craft? Like art and science, you know what I mean? What's the percentage breakdown for you? Like, is it 50-50? Is it 90-10? What well, is that's it? A, that's a tough question because it might have to do with whoever you ask the question. I don't know. Yeah. I'd like say it's about it? half and half, I yeah. think. You know? I mean, because first you have to, you know, have the desire and the, you know, and, you know, realize something or be inspired, but then you've got to know how to, you know, get it out there and edit it, you know, make it, you know, work and make it so other people can enjoy listening to it, you know. Right, the craft of the it. The craft of it, yeah. And that's the work. Is that the work for you? Is that the hard part? Um, yeah, that's probably the, 
that's probably the hard part. Well, sometimes the hard part is just coming up with, you know, you have an idea and you just can't seem to get past a certain, you know, you've got a couple of lines and, you know, just trying to get the whole thing, you know, to flow. And so that's why certain songs take longer than others. Yeah. And how about the the nuts and bolts for you? Do you talk into your iPhone? Like, what, what do you keep a journal? Like, what's your what are your t what yeah. are your tools of the creative? I I, um, I have a folder that I keep, you know, all my notes and stuff in, and I I have a lot of uh, cocktail napkins from <laughs> bars where I've written. You know, I'll get inspired just at any time of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Um, you know, jot something down on a napkin, put it in my purse, and then, you know, so I end up with all these scraps of papers and napkins, and I put them in this folder that I keep, and then when I sit down to write, I, you know, get all that out, and, you know. And then recently, I actually devised a, I took one of my briefcases, and I put, um, you like know, dividers? dividers in them because I had all these songs I was working on and titles and they were almost finished so I you know put in alphabetical order you know all the songs and because sometimes I'd write a little bit on this one and a little bit on this one and you know so I've got about you know 10 or so other songs that I'm working on and whatever mood I'm in I'll so that's separate now from the folder with the, you know. The bits. The bits. I actually went through the folder with the bits and pulled out whatever lines or ideas that I'd written down that I thought might fit with this one particular song, you know, that I have an idea for and put it in the folder. Because there is a cut and paste out <laughs> I love it though. It's just it's just so interesting. Uh, your um, observing eye is almost that at, at times in some of your songs, where it's almost a, a journalist's kind of approach mm -hmm. to writing. Like I'm thinking, just for example, even like sitting in a kitchen, sitting in a kitchen. Okay, we know where you are. Right. House of Macon. Okay, what's on the radio? The red is on the radio. Right. What's this, what? Smell of coffee, eggs, and like. Right, that just the start of that song, you know, sit in a kitchen, house and making, Loretta on the radio, smell of coffee, eggs and bacon, her wheels on the gravel. Like that detail, that mm -hmm. painting a picture in four short lines, there's an element of that that's journalistic. It's almost, mm -hmm. you know, and, and is that what gets written on cocktail napkins? Like you see, you're in a bar and you see an interaction between people. You know, it's that, it's that, well, that ability to observe humans. Yeah. It's, um, it is a, the ability of, to observe and, you know, I mean, sometimes it might just be a line, somebody says something or something, you know, and I'll write. One time I was talking to my dad on the phone, in fact, this entered into one of the songs on the album, uh, The Temporary Nature of Any Precious Thing, because I just lost a close friend and I think it was John Chimbodi who, played bass in my first band. And I was talking to my dad about it on the phone and he said, well, you know, the temporary nature of any precious thing, that just makes it all the more precious. <laughs> Why did you know? You know. That's then a gift. The other line, he said something about sometimes the saddest joys are the richest ones. Wow. And, you know, he could come up with these lines sometimes, <laughs> just talking. Um, how he spoke. Yeah. One of the questions yeah. I had on my thing here was, what is Southern about you? And I know that's kind of a weird question because, you know, even what you said about Southern writers weren't in style mm -hmm. then, but there is such a rich history of Southern writers and the admiration mm -hmm. and that abil storytelling ability and stuff. And I wondered with you, what you identify as being Southern about either you as a person or you as a, as a songwriter. What is Southern about you? Um, think? Well, it's kind of a hard question to answer and just, you know, I mean, it's like what you just said, you know, but when I, when I was growing up, my dad was, I was very aware that I was Southern and, 
there was a certain pride about it, you know, and, um, you know, my dad would say things like, I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, damn Yankees. <laughs> and, you know, there was just, and maybe there, because of the fact that there was, you know, it was kind of like, Southerners were looked at as, you know, stupid and dumb and hicks and hillbillies. I mean, every time you see a movie out of Hollywood and somebody has a Southern accent, right. they're usually portrayed as a dumbass. Right. So there right. was this whole, I can remember talking to uh, some friends of mine in New Jersey, actually John Charty was a close friend of my dad's and we would go visit them and he had a daughter about the same, we were about the same age and anyway, I remember we were hanging with the kids and they said, oh, they smoke pot in Arkansas? <laughs> you know, and stuff like that and you know. <laughs> and probably the whole thing, like when my dad first started as a writer, and you know, right. there's this whole stigma about, you know, Southerners and whatever. And mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine that now, because it's, you know, but, you know, this was back in the late 50s, early 60s, and right. I don't know what else to say about it, really, except it's, it's an identity. It's just like anything. I mean, you identify with who you are and where you're from and right. I've always appreciated people's roots and I always want to know where, where people are from mm -hmm. you know and where they grew up and and I don't know sense of place right. you know roots right you know it is interesting um, I had an interaction with somebody uh, just the other day this past weekend this young man came up to me, and he was about 20 years old, and he said, um, oh, I've been listening to you my whole life. And I was like, mm, kind of makes me a little uncomfortable to hear that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I said, wow, man, that's really cool. Like, you're 20 years old, and you've been listening to WFUV for 20 years. I said, you know, that, wow, that, like, you're probably a little cooler than your other 20-year-old friends that haven't listened to WFUV for 20 years. And, uh, and I said, what? Like, what is it that you've pulled away from WF? And before I could even finish the sentence, he said, Lucinda Williams. <laughs> and I thought, that is so awesome. Like, you know, I was like, wow. here's this 20-year-old kid, right, who now has been listening to WFUV for 20 years, right? And he knows Lucinda. And like when I asked him, you know, Lucinda was his answer. And I've asked you uh, in the different times that we've, uh, you know, sat down for interviews about your influences. But this just made me think, do you have any sense the influence that you've put out into the world yeah. now, I, and it kind of goes the other way now, you it know? It does, and it's, and I don't really, you know, I'm not walking around aware of it all the time, but it's just when, you know, somebody will say something like that, or the ages of, you know, the people who come to see me play, you know, and, because I have a lot of, you know, people in their, early 20s whose parents brought them to see me, whose parents were fans and they brought their kids when they were little, three or four years old, and then their kids grew up and they come, you know. So it's a real mixed age group in the audience and everything. But, you know. Kind of gives you faith in the future of society, I think, when you hear stories like yeah. that, you know. Very cool. Well, I think now we're gonna segue into um, some of the questions from the audience. Did you guys give us some good ones here? Wow. So I'm just going to read a few of these, all right? You up for this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like it's a game show or something. I like, I mean, okay, what's the big... I did maybe just put my game show voice on, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Lucinda Williams. Okay. Uh, which of your songs have women told you are the most helpful to them when they are facing adversity? Okay, which... Which, Which of your songs have fans told you, but, right. but, but she specifically okay. said women, have told you are the most helpful uh, when they're facing adversi adversity? Um, let's see. I don't know, you know, that's a, I mean, I could think of a couple, like that one song that's kind of obvious, I guess, that, you know, walk on, you know, that one, but I'm trying to think about my earlier ones. 
Because um, it seems like just as a whole, I've had women tell me, you know, just your songs help me. So it's no, I've never, it's never really been connected to any one specific song. Um, unless you want to get real literal about it, like that song, Come On. Yeah. <laughs> you know. That's good um, for everybody. Or, yeah, that's good for everybody. And, <laughs> well, that's the other thing. I tend to make my songs fairly, you know, appeal to both sexes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there are very few of my songs that actually, uh, you know, that don't do that, so. Uh, here's another one. One of my favorite records is Return of the Grievous Angel. Uh, how'd you get involved with that tribute album? And uh, here's a good question. What did Grant Parsons mean to you? Okay, well, Emmy Lou uh, was putting that together, the tribute to Grant Parsons album. And I was living in Nashville. She asked me to do it. Um, she wanted me to do that particular song, which was very challenging. Yeah. Because it just goes all over the place melodically. Um, we spent hours and hours and hours in the studio with the all the different musicians were pulled in from different bands, and they were all great, but you know, nobody had played together before. Um, the producer refused to use Pro Tools or anything like that, which means that if one person makes a mistake, like the bass player, um, then I have to sing the song all over again. So it wasn't really one of my more, most pleasant memories uh -huh. <laughs> because I had to sing the song over and over and over <laughs> and over until I had lost my good take. And so the producer and I kind of butt heads, butt heads a little bit, you know. And how about the Graham Parsons part of the question? What a Graham? Um, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not really, you know, I mean, I remember when that Grievous Angels album came out. I remember a friend of mine. At the time when it came out, it, I, I didn't think really that much of it, to tell you the truth. Right. Um, and then, you know, like he was just one of hundreds of other amazing, right. you know, albums, artists that were, you know, I mean, at that time in the 60s and part of the 70s. And um, everybody assumes that I'm, you know, this huge Grand Parsons, like, you know, he walks on water or something, but, you know, clearly he was very charming and, you know, <laughs> very good looking and, you know, he had this sort of charisma or whatever. <laughs> you know, you can tell by looking at the pictures of him and, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what is your favorite cover of one Sorry. of your songs? No, it's good. I, I know I'm disappointing some of you. <laughs> <laughs> we, love, we love it. Uh, what is your favorite cover of one of your songs? Um, oh, my favorite color, cover of one of my songs I just heard recently, um, Soldier Song by Sean Rao. Yes. That's amazing. Sean Rao, it's uh, R-O-W-E, and he's a really interesting, um, distinctive voice, amazing guy. Amazing uh, voice. And Soldier's yes. Song is, is a, uh, well, you talk about writing more of, from a historic or a topical yeah. point of view. That really is that a, was one of that song's songs. a great example of that. Yes, I've, I've, I'm kind of speaking from the Soldier's point of view in the song as he's over, he, over there, you know, fighting and his wife and child are at home and he's imagining what, what she's doing while he's, you know, at his post standing guard or whatever it is he's doing and, you know. So this guy cut these songs by different female artists and just, I saw it on, Tom played it for me on, uh, 
YouTube thing. Right, right. And, or whatever it was. And it just blew me away. Yeah, it, it is super cool. And then, of course, the other one is Emmy Lou's version of Sweet Old World. Yeah. Which I love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, what books are your favorites? Favorites might be misspelled here, by the way. Any two? Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Good for you. Good. Um, anything by Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. She's a, my, I just, I got into her when I was about 16 and just read everything I could get my hands on. And uh, Eudora Welty, you know, the dark, mysterious, southern gothic kind of stuff. Are you reading anything currently? Um, I had to do this for an article. I had to talk about, and I had to go back and sort of like remember these books I'd read. And currently, I'm not reading anything. Good. <laughs> at the time. Now, sure. see, that was a tr trick question. <laughs> um, but you don't want to know the, the, the books that I listed for this this piece it's sure. going to come out for the what was it what magazine i can't remember um it might have been the new yorker or something and they asked different artists you know to name their favorite books or something and talk about them okay so one was flannery o'connor's wise blood um dusty springfield's uh biography dancing with demons oh cool and um, Charles Bukowski's Women. <laughs> I put that one in there because, for, and I actually I started rereading it and remembered why I liked it so much. Um, but he talks about at one point in the book, going to giving a reading in this college town, and going to, you know, an after the reading party, which is at my dad's house. And my dad told the story. I wasn't, I wasn't there. I was away from home at that point. But my dad told the story about how, you know, everybody was getting real drunk, which they always did at the end of these parties. And apparently Charles Bukowski was attracted to this woman who was at the party. And he told her she had nice legs. And, you know, she said, well, she got it. She sort of was like, sort of that 70s, you know, faux feminist, <laughs> offensive. Well, let me see your legs or something like that. And they ended up going downstairs and hooking up in the <laughs> downstairs bedroom. <laughs> you know. So he talks about that in the book. Oh wow. <laughs> so anyway. That's pretty funny. <laughs> that was just a, yeah. Uh, here's one. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not reading anything right now. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm not either. It's okay. Um, Crosswords. Oh, are you a words with friends? Or you, or you do an old fashioned in the newspaper? Crosswords. Old fashioned in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This might even answer this question. What do you like to do in your off time when you're not touring? I really dig you, Kevin. Um, well. And he lives nearby. <laughs> <laughs> Crosswords. I'm, th this is going to sound really, I'm just your regular old girl, you know. Um, I look for old gringo boots. Shopping. Shopping online. <laughs> Actually, I found that I spend less money if I shop online because, you know, I could sort of, you know, get it out of a system. You put it in the, put it in the basket. You know, <laughs> put this in the basket. Put this. You know, then you get to the end and you go, holy shit. <laughs> you know. 
then you have a minute uh, to like get re get re realistic about yeah. it. Yeah. And then you go, okay, delete, delete, <laughs> delete. You know, whereas if I'm in a store, I get overwhelmed. You know, it's too much sensory overload. And I just, the last time I did, went on a shopping spree like that was that, was here in, it's always in New York City. Because <laughs> everything's just out there, all, you know. It was a trash and vaudeville. Oh, cool. <laughs> right? I didn't try anything on. <laughs> Tom was next door watching a, watching a game at this Irish pub place or whatever. So he's gone. So I'm he. <laughs> so I just, I started just throwing things in the basket. <laughs> you know. And get up there, and, you know, you can't delete. <laughs> <laughs> so now I shop online and I'm fine. I'm Zappos. <laughs> Zappos, love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, Gulio from Australia asks, what do you consider to be your best ever album? The new one. Excellent. And That's um, what you always want to think, you know, but I do, really, because I feel like just each one gets, you know, a little bit better. And when are you coming to Australia? Um, I think we're talking about maybe sometime in the spring next year. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and here's one that I think is, might be a rhetorical question. You look great, exclamation point. Do blondes really have more fun, question mark. Thanks, wow. <laughs> and then the follow-up question, <laughs> are, are you playing anywhere tonight after here? Uh, not tonight, but on Thursday night, uh, Lucinda is at Celebrate Brooklyn at Prospect Park Bandshell, and then Saturday night at the Caramore American Roots Festival in Katona. Yeah. And Friday in New Haven. And Friday yes, in New Haven. Yes, the green, or what's it called, on the green in New Haven or something. Is it on the green? On, on the green something like that, Good. yeah. 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 Uh, so that's great. Um, so Lucinda, you kind of hinted at it early on in our conversation. Tell us what's next. You said there's a, another album in the works. Yeah, we got, I just recently, oh, I did, I took another one of my dad's poems and made and wrote a new song. It's called Dust. And we recorded that and then a couple of other new songs. I wrote a new song called If My Love Could Kill about uh, my dad's Alzheimer's. Um, and um, we recorded those. And so I'm really excited about getting this new stuff out. Think it'll be yeah. this year? Or, um, um, those? Maybe at the beginning of the year or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Fantastic. That's a business question mm -hmm. for Tom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds great. Um, but what about do the blondes have more fun questions? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll leave that to you. Well, I don't know. I'm in, you know, I grew, when I was little, I had real blonde hair. And then as I got older, it got sort of mousy, dirty blonde and, you know, mousy brown. And then when I first moved out to LA, this girl, this, you know, she said, oh, let me get, let me highlight your hair. And I was blown away, and I was like, wow, you know, and I just loved it. So, um, and then one year, I decided to just not have highlights anymore, and I had this kind of cute short in my hair. I decided to just go down, back to my, whatever my color is now, which I, some kind of brown or something. It was this real dark brown. And that was kind of an interesting sort of identity shift, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but then I ended up going back to blonde. This sounds really lame and <laughs> kind of silly. I could go from being, you know, quite serious and sort of <laughs> academic to just completely silly. <laughs> I think people think I have this kind of spaciness thing about me, but I'm not really mm. like that. I'm not, I don't mean to be, you know, I'm Aquarius. I'm all my, I'm, it's all air and water. <laughs> all my moon is in Cancer. My rising sign is Libra. Everything, I have no earth in my chart. <laughs> you know. 
And so I'm all just, it's all ethereal and kind of, you know, emotional and Makes for that. good creativity. It does. It doesn't make for good trying to make a decision <laughs> about, <laughs> especially when you get Tom, who's a Libra, and his moon's in Cancer. The two of us trying to decide where to go eat. <laughs> <laughs> where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> and then if somebody else in the group says, let's go here, are you agreeable Then we to go, yeah, that's good. Somebody make a decision. <laughs> I don't, you know. Uh, well, Lucinda, it's <laughs> always wonderful to be in your company and always wonderful Thank to get to you. talk to you and, and get a... Uh, uh, get to get to share what's uh, what's inside your head and your heart. It's always a wonderful thing. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we might ask you to play one more song. Okay. You up for that? Yeah. Good. You said you're going to play another song. Y'all, this is mo the more I've said, I think, to any situation, except maybe for Mark Maron. That's how you, sorry, sorry, Mark. Anyway. And did President Obama do that with him? Yes. Did he actually go to his house? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Probably didn't go in the main part of the house because that's where the cats are and his <laughs> whatever. He's got this sort of separate. Let's put it this way: it's very casual and funky. <laughs> you know, it looks like a writer's house. It's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, presidential. <laughs> no, it's not. That's why I'm so impressed. I can't believe that he actually went to his house. Wow. Um, and by the way, I'm, since we're talking about candidates, I'm right now, I don't know what, it, if it's gonna, you know, do any good or whatever, but I'm supporting Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Yeah. God, I love him. <laughs> just, you know. So this is called When I Look at the World. <clears throat> I've been out of love. I've been talked to about. I've been locked up, I've been shut out I've had some bad dreams I've been filled with regret I've made a mess of things Been a total wreck I've been disrespected Been taken for a ride I've been rejected And had my patience tried Still I look at the world and all its glory, I look at the world And it's a different story Each time I look at the world I've been used And I've been blue I've been abused I've been lied to I've been left behind, been misunderstood, been out of my mind and not feeling good. I've been lost, I've been turned away, I paid the cost, and there's been hell to pay. But I look at the world, and all its glory, I look at the world, and it's a Different story each time I look at the world. I've 
I've been unforgiven I've been let down I've had the truth hidden And I've been kicked around I've been wasted I've been on the brink I've had my faith tested And my spirit sink I've been unwelcome I've been unloved I've been cheated on And made a fool of but I look at the world and all oh, its glory. I look at the world and it's a different story each time I look at the world. And all oh, its glory. I look at the world and it's a different story each time I look at the world. Each time I love the world Each time I love the world Thank you. Oh, my mic's on. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs>